Good evening and welcome to this very special episode on Money Control, the Diwali Muhurat Roundtable. I'm Mahalakshmi and I have with me six brilliant stock market investors to help us navigate this year. Samir Arora, Devina Mehra, Manish Chokani, Sunil Singhania, Madhusudan Kela and Prashant Jain. Thank you so much gentlemen and the lady for joining me on this discussion today. Let me ask this question that is really on everybody's uh, uh, mind today. This year till date if we see, in rupee terms the Nifty has gone nowhere, it's pretty much flat. But in dollar terms if we see, we are down about 12-13%. And in the US, if you saw the numbers about a week back, US was down more than 30%. So, and because of our past experiences from 2000 and 2008, we continue to believe that markets are not decoupled. But a 12% down, uh, down, uh, down versus a 30% down is already very divergent. So my question is, the fear that we live in, the fact that we cannot be sanguine if the US markets are not, uh, uh, are not settled, is this fear really legitimate or is it unfounded? So, Manish? Wow. That's a great uh, question to open with. Uh, the way I think of it is, uh, Mahalakshmi, it's, it's true that you can't be divorced from what's happening in the world. Uh, and it's also true that in 2008, we saw how whatever happens in the US and the developed world comes and affects us. But I do think there's a variation to it now that we lived in a unipolar world after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it was a one direction bull market for bonds as interest rates kept falling. It was a one-way directional bull market for equities as again rates were low and multiples kept going up and the US became the center of really the universe. But with what's now going on with China, Russia, Saudi, the uh, world is breaking into a more multipolar world and therefore the decoupling is in progress where globalization is in a way it's over uh, and you're looking for resilience in supply chains rather than just in time mm. and so on. So we are part of that theme. Uh, we are not the makers of that, we only can follow the themes which are happening in the world. And the, the emergence of, for example, the retail investor, which these gentlemen will be better placed to talk about, uh, has made the case that you don't necessarily have to fall or rise in line with uh, the leader of the world. Very similar to stock markets, right? When the IT sector fell in 2000, yeah. someone else took up the leadership. When FMCG fell in the era pr prior to that, someone else took up the leadership. And the same thing will happen uh, as well. And mankind goes on. Sure. Devina, you want to come in on this? Okay, I mean, see this uh, decoupling is a, a strange word because you are neither at one extreme ever nor the other. So you do, uh, uh, you are affected by global trends, what is happening in the globe. But there are also broad long-term trends. So if you go back last year, uh, uh, last year on your show, I had said two things. One, that rupee depreciation is almost certain to happen. And two, that India will outperform. And there were two reasons for India to outperform, uh, uh, which were that relative to its own history, it had underperformed a long, long time. So 2010 to 20, you had not even beaten fixed deposit returns. And the other was that even globally, you'd been underperforming a long time. And 2021 was the first year where you started to outperform. So this year, as you rightly said, uh, global markets are down at, as of September end calendar year to date. Global markets were on the average down 25 and a half percent. S&P was close to that. And uh, we were down, but we were number eight out of 42 indices because there were only four or five indices which were actually in the green. So that's the context. Uh, but I mean, I also think, you know, many times we make stories to uh, of why something is happening. If you go back to 2003 to 2007, also emerging markets outperformed hugely. You know, uh, US in spite of having coming out of a very uh, big fall after that uh, dot-com burst, in those five years went up only 60% did not take out its previous highs, whereas the emerging market index went up three and a half times, India went up six times, Brazil went up 10 times, et cetera, et cetera. And at that time also the story was that now US is over and the next century belongs to emerging markets. Then there was this whole decade 2010 to 20 where the dollar strengthened, US markets did very well. So the stories always follow. 
but uh, fundamentally uh, yes uh, and uh, also in relative to the history we are not above the trend line so a uh, possibility of a big crash is i don't see that i see the outperformance relative to the globe continuing but as uh, you know again there is not a one to one correlation between the economy and the stock market either in the us globally or here so those are two different things uh, but i suppose we'll be talking about that more going forward yep so i wanted specifically samir you because you've been talking about this quite quite a bit all of this year that you know we should be fearful of what happens in the us no quarrel about that but would you expect such a divergence uh, which makes us question if at all there is such a strong co correlation as we usually believe so first thing is decoupling i guess you mean that if one market is down the other should be up that is quite tough to do but if you look at it over time these things decouple or a decouple or go their own way so for example every year if we say that we are looking at the us market or overnight factor so if you look at it over 20 and 25 years uh, india has outperformed most of the other markets by like china it has outperformed by 11% per annum for 25 years and if you look at it for 30 years there was a report from i think bank of america merrill lynch that US, india is up some 7.5% per annum and most of the other markets are up 1 to 3% per annum whereas only us is up some 8% so i would say that i learned from it that i don't over bet that if we are uh, doing well in the absence of us and generally the globe being happy that becomes a tough thing so relative outperformance is as valuable i think if you look at compounding how does compounding work it means that if in bad days you can lose less and in good days make as much or a little less or more the compounding of that is more valuable than losing a lot when the market is down so this year i think india has done tremendously well in any slightly longer term compounding potential sure i'll want to ask more specifically on where do we head i mean what kind of divergence should we see over the next one year but before that one more macro question and all of this year you know as all of last year actually as the markets climbed uh, newer highs the main headline was that we have we are moving up in terms of rank in terms of gdp right so if you look at nominal gdp we are number 6 in the world in terms of market cap we are number 4 in the world but if you look at the per capita we are number 130 145 in terms of uh, i think nominal uh, nominal per capita and probably 125 in terms in terms of ppp does this worry you madhu because you know you and sunil for sure of course everybody also take heavy bets on consumption and one of the big stories in india is how we can continue to grow on the back of our demographics on the back of all the you know uh, domestic engines firing but this number this you know such a divergence in terms of macro numbers versus per capita does that worry you well actually that is very logical isn't it when you are uh, operating at such a large population bet and you are comparing yourself to countries which are maybe 120th of your size in terms of capita uh, population obviously your per capita income will be uh, will be lower only so in absolute term it doesn't worry me because that is the potential which you see that if you have to go we came from 300 billion dollars to 3 trillion dollars in last 30 years right if i take an x 30 year bet if we can go from 3 trillion to 30 trillion over the over the years obviously our per capita will also go up in the uh, in the time in the time frame to the extent it has impact on the stock picking that is fine but it's not in absolute term i am not worried because our per capita is lower so there are no opportunities here sunil essentially the question is i mean this whole theory that we are on self propulsion and we can drive our own growth uh, when you look at it from the perspective of uh, per capita does it worry you so you know i think uh, malakmi yes uh, you know we are uh, low in terms of per capita compared to where the other developed world are but we also have to see where we have come to you know so from having maybe 75% of the population who could afford nothing we have at least gone down to at least 60% of the population who is able to afford quite a few things and as we move forward 
more and more of the population will come into that bracket where uh, they would be consumers themselves. So, you know, if you again go back and see the other uh, countries on a, you know, on a per capita basis, maybe we are $2,000, uh, but on purchasing power parity, we are maybe six, $7,000. And we are right there in terms of tipping point. If you see the example of China or Korea or even some of the other countries, and it is also getting reflected in the size of some of our own companies and sectors, you know, where the companies and sectors were 10 years back and where they're today. I think almost all the consumption uh, sectors are at least 10x of where they were 10 years back. And there is no reason to believe that in the next 10 years, the similar kind of growth would be there in terms of the demand for all of them. So I think, yes, uh, the per capita is low in uh, terms of uh, or relative terms, but that is an opportunity. We are only going to go up. And I think there is no doubt that this $2,000 would uh, you know, become $10,000 in a matter of maybe 15, 20 years. And I think that is that is what we are all paying for, right? Sure. I, Prashant? I just to give some context, unlike in developed world where you may have a bell-shaped consumption curve and therefore mm. you see there's a big middle class, the India demand curve is a vertical line mm. and I'm just using rough numbers, okay, don't hold me. But you may sell 3 million cars, but you may sell 6 million air conditioners, mm. which is double. Then you sell 12 million refrigerators, which is again double. Then you sell 24 million two-wheelers, which is again double. Mm. Now, and so on. You go to you know cellular phones, you'll be at 48 million and so on. So there's a doubling of markets at different price points. But all these people actually do want to consume. And it's a matter of time as you keep coming into that per capita level, as, as they were rightly pointing out, that you get to that consumption. To use again a very stark example, and all these gentlemen have worked in the fund management industry. Did you imagine in India, that I think SBI mutual fund, is it now close to $100 billion AUM? Like when sure. I know I started my career, we used to think, my God, Capital International, $90 billion fund, it's so big, it was something we could not conceive of. Yeah. Today, that industry is the one which is supporting the Indian markets, even when the FII sold $30 billion last year. So the power of what can happen in a large domestic economy will play out and there are therefore these different layers and levels at which different stocks will keep performing. And it could be a 20, 30 year story as they are rightly pointing out. Sure. Prashant, this whole consumption theme uh, at a macro level, do you see it playing out? Of course, like Manish said, you know, even if markets are flat, you know, a lot of fund managers like you, definitely all of you will outperform because you're great bottom up stock pickers. But overall, do you see uh, the stock contrast in per capita being a stumbling block to consumption growth? No, Malakshmi, in fact, that is the opportunity. And because see your uh, real uh, GDP in India for last 40 years, we have grown at 6 to 8 percent and now population growth in India has declined. We are growing barely above 1 percent now. So that means if your real GDP is 7 percent, 6 percent is the real increase in per capita income. Mm. And that is the real opportunity. So as affordability goes up, uh, and that is what is driving growth in India, demographics and low penetration. So I don't worry about that at all. That is precisely the opportunity for growth in India. Sure. Manish, coming back to global markets, I mean, what are the big risks that you see going into uh, this year, especially on the geopolitical front? Well, for India, it's oil, oil, oil all the time. If it goes yeah. to 120, 130, because our external balance sheet is very vulnerable. Mm. Unfortunately, we've not solved the energy problem in India for 30 years with exploration blocks being given out, nor have we built a big tourism inflow. We are very vulnerable to remittances. So that external balance sheet is a vulnerability for us, and which is what I guess uh, all shocks in India eventually emanate from outside. And markets always uh, suffer when there's leverage. Every crisis I know in the world has been caused by leverage, mm. including what is happening in the world now. You, you, you will get the war and you'll get the COVID, but we quickly rebound from those. But these are structural longer term uh, issues to, to think about. But so, I'll pass to my other colleagues. Yeah, here. I have a, c a related question to this oil thing. You know, one of the big shifts that has happened over the last um, year or so, is, uh, this year actually, because of this uh, Russia-Ukraine thing, is that our energy basket now 20%, nearly I think 18% of our oil comes from Russia and there you are able to do it in rubles as opposed to the dollar. So if this sort of trend continues, if we are able to build on that, do you think 
the vulnerability that we have to oil today and to the dollar is that going to stand diminished will that be substantial enough madhu i think it will be a longer term trend i don't think that you know this uh, russians think because the distance is still very high yeah how much crude can you actually uh, bring from there and what is the discount can you get let's say today you you may get any discount but on a long term yeah. sustainable basis those discount will not uh, i don't think that is I the solution think. you have to definitely do more in india more exploration or we have to uh, you know deepen our sources like what is being done a small step on the ethanol industry for instance that is real solving many problems together you solve the problem of the farmer by giving them better prices you solve the problem of clean energy you solve uh, you encourage domestic production to so things like them which can make us more energy dependent uh, you do, i would just like to respond to the question which you asked manish you know what could go wrong see in my mind apart from oil if there is any major global conflict which were mm. to happen any big geopolitical thing see till now india has very nicely taken a neutral position yeah. right and we are neither here nor there so we are friends with everyone but if there if there were a real major conflict which happens and if you have to take side with one or the other which you will have to in in case of a larger conflict eh, that is a real big worry from uh, from a market perspective because certainly right. markets are not discounting that right. you know neither uh, global markets not there is a lot of fear a lot right. is being spoken but no major conflict in the world is discounted by markets according to me sure so manish oil madhu major conflict uh, prashant i think see oil is a worry and i don't think ruble will say uh, solve the problem because it does not fundamentally alter your inflow outflow situation because uh, rubles also you need to earn them so which means you are what you are importing so it is just a accounting issue i don't think it changes uh, anything i think the what i would worry about apart from uh, oil is the us interest rates because us interest rates i think had few tailwinds in the last two decades one was continuously declining export prices out of china now the working age population in china is degrowing for last 4 5 years chinese wages are going up so i think those the tailwind of lower export prices out of china is not there us interest rates are going up mortgage yields in us mm. will need to keep pace with that therefore rents in us will have to go up and the uh, working age population growth in us itself is now declining close to zero for a variety of reasons and us therefore all the three sectors the import of goods the rents which have a 20% weightage and services all three i think face is structurally higher inflation and therefore i feel that the inflation rates in us will take uh, probably a economic slow down to come down and therefore the cost of capital in us may actually settle higher and it would not be catastrophic for india because if you go back to 2005 pre lehman we were pretty much in the current uh, zone of cost of capital but it does make us vulnerable to any disruption in capital flows uh, i think if the world slows down oil prices should logically come down hmm. and capital flows could also get impacted so they may offset each other but if you have a fall in capital flows and oil going up it could be quite uh, challenging for correct India. correct sunil what would you peg as the biggest risk to markets primarily from external factors so you know if you go back uh, see the last 15 20 years uh, you know the risks which are visible and which we all talk about actually when they happen the markets don't uh, get impacted as much so you know with due respect uh, whatever risks have been talked about i think all of us have uh, uh you know analyzed micro analyzed a lot including oil inflation global factors currency and so on and so forth but what has hit us has been risks which we have not even thought about so russia and ukraine hit us uh, when we were least expecting it covid hit us when we were least expecting it so frankly whatever risks we all know i i am not uh, frankly too much worried about it Uh, it is the the risk which we are not discounting, which can be like a six sigma event, which you know someone eluded that if it, if the crisis uh, as far as conflict is concerned really gets out of hand, 
you know, so some of these risks which are not discounted, I think, are the risks which I am worried about. Uh, oil, my medium to long term view is um, very bearish. Uh, I think whether OPEC reduces production or not doesn't matter. The way uh, every country is now looking at alternatives uh, because they know that they have been really, really squeezed in this, uh, you know, Russia led uh, gas squeeze. Uh, and the way renewables and alternatives are uh, uh, being uh, sort of sought after and billions and billions going there. Uh, medium to long term, my view on oil is very negative. Near term, it might go up and down five and dollars. But I think it's a bigger conflict or something which we have not even thought about is what uh, we should be worried about. I think all these inflation and all is of more than discount. Devina, do you think uh, oil terminal interest rates in the U.S., these are discounting, uh, are discounted in the market right now? Okay, see, I mean, as I told you that the economy and the stock market, as we all know, are two distinct animals. So even if you look at the U.S. itself, uh, yes, I mean, I, I am fairly certain that uh, further slowdown, recession, whatever would come, interest rates would continue to go up. Uh, but the question is how much of it is already in the price? If you look at the U.S. itself, in 50 years, this has been only the fourth time that S&P has been negative uh, all three quarters in, in, in the first three quarters, only the fourth time in 50 years. If you look at bond and stock prices both being down significantly in the US, it is the third time in a century, including 1931. So, I mean, the question in all this is that how much of it is already discounted in the price? And probability wise, the global markets, at least, I mean, I'm not talking Europe just now. I'm talking more the US and a few others, like Canada and all that. Is it already in the price? Probably, yes. If you look at India, India, to my mind, I mean, you talked about that domestic consumption story. Um, again, you know, this is not necessarily about the stock market, but if you look at the economy as a whole, it is not just that we are per capita is lower. The fact is that we have not crossed our 2019 per capita till now this year. And it is showing in all sorts of things. Um, you know, how many people want Nariga jobs? How many people want free rations? There's a lot of distress still in the economy. Your mobile penetration has gone down, actually come down in uh, percentage terms. Two-wheeler sales last year were the lowest in 10 years. I think I spoke about it last year also. This year, of course, they have gone up from there. So all these indicators also last two, three quarters, there has been improvement. But we have a major issue. We also have a major issue on our so-called demographic dividend. Because if you look at how a demographic dividend plays out, there are three components to it. Number of people in working age the labor participation rate, how many of them are actually working, and then the productivity. So we have the first one, which we have for, I mean, again, a limited number of years, but we are not able to generate jobs. Even pre-COVID, we were at 40-year unemployment high. So that those are the things that worry me on, the long, on a longer term. On a medium term, probably not, also because there has been a movement towards more formalization of the economy, more things moving to the organized sector, which means, of course, more things moving to the listed space, which in any case, many times is uh, catering to the relatively well-off. If you look at, for example, listed real estate companies, the, com the uh, client they cater to is, is the, are the relatively well-off. and that part has done well basically organized sector employees have done well in the last few years but the rest of the economy is hurting but as i said economy and stock market are two different things so you know my view on the uh, stock market remains more sanguine and in the us again i think a lot of it is already in the price i mean the nuclear uh, tactical uh, weapon which are, which is talked about occasionally whether putin will go in uh, uh, drop a nuclear device in Ukraine. I don't think the probability is very high. I mean, I am no geopolitical expert. Uh, but uh, my real worry is that even if he does it and it becomes something that is accepted by the world, I mean, France has already said that they don't really care even if, I mean, at least they're not going to act if, even if Russia does something like that. And that, if it becomes a, something that is acceptable to the world, that would be a worry for me. 
uh, more than the direct fallout. So, I mean, the, my medium to long term worries for India is are more to do with uh, what we do with ourselves rather than so much of an external shock. Yes, our vulnerability to energy and oil remains, uh, but I don't see an immediate problem there. Thank you, beyond thank what has already happened. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Devina, for articulating that point. I should have articulated it better. It's not just a per capita consumption worry, but also the destruction that has happened post-COVID. And we keep talking about it the all the time, the K-shaped recovery and so on. So thanks for bringing that up. Samir, back to you. Uh, one, on the geopolitical front, uh, external risks, do you think all of it is really priced in? So I don't want to answer your question. I'll comment on the other uh, <laughs> because I was thinking of what I would say. So I totally agree with Devina that there is really not so much of connection between economy and market as you're trying to make. Because simply look at the last 25 years, the best economy in terms of growth, in terms of per capita improvement and all was China and the market is up 1% per annum. If you say per capita, look at the cap per capita growth then look at the performance of Korea and Taiwan, much less than India. So these things don't matter. I also don't believe even reforms matter so much because many of the reforms actually help the economy but don't help the market. Let us say today we say that the Indian government has allowed FDI in 20 sectors and people can come in with no uh, you know, approval or easy approval. That helps the economy, helps create jobs, but it puts uh, competition against our listed companies that may be slightly protected because it is more difficult to get in. So these things are not one-to-one -one in uh, in any way. But I agree with Devina, and should maybe your second question is answered, that the U.S. market, I don't think the inflation problem will go away, or at least it won't go back to the 2% kind number that the Federal Reserve may today be targeting. I think they'll accept a slightly higher number, simply because there are two big picture trends. One is anti-globalization, only you could call it which was that you are not, or you could call it that people want to have a second China plus one, or they want to be near shore, or they want to make chips in their own country, or that they consider China as a competitor now more than just a developing economy, which they are trying to also help. And second is the cost of uh, dealing with the climate and you know all these alternatives, which may all be very good in the long term but the amount of money required is too big and that cost somebody has to bear. But from a market point of view, I think the US market plus minus two, three months as these events play out, and then there is a pause because I don't think they will increase it beyond the next three meetings, which is November, December, and Jan. Then plus minus that, I think the market will at least stop falling every day or at least we'll stop thinking that it can fall every day. And then we, our markets can do well. But let's not link every line to a 10, 20 year economic growth for India because last 25 years, Indian market is already nearly the best market in the world. If we can get that year by year, that is enough. We don't have to harder sell it to say that the reason for investing in equity is because this is the golden time. The thing is that normally equity markets do well. Indian markets have done well in the past and there is absolutely no reason why they should not do as well. But it's not otherwise some thing where, you know, you sell it so hard that people have to sell their houses to buy equity. I think it is easy to convince yourself that equity is good. It has been in the past for India and it will be at least similar or maybe a little higher. But Fair. there's no need. If it comes more than that, we'll all take it with both hands. But I don't think just trade GDP growth matters. Otherwise, it would matter in all these places. US GDP growth is 2 to 2.5% per annum for 25 years. Their dollar return is 8% per annum. Equity markets need their, as Devina was saying, you know, this unorganized to organize. Which sectors are they really targeting? Which I think in India's case, we mostly target the 300 million, 400 million population for nearly all listed companies. It's a great story. Sure. Sameer, since you brought in, um, uh, you know, emerging uh, markets and other markets, you know, one of the things that you have also been saying uh, all of last year is, 
at least last year till up until last year we had this feeling that india had just you know arrived and foreign investors have discovered india now it's looked at as a separate asset class because of the of the amount of money and the kind of size of bets that you know uh, that uh, that india has become even now it's double the msci weight right india but this year till date if we see that entire flow that we got last year has got reversed instead of us that entire flow went into brazil and i remember prashant saying this last year when you know all of us were thinking that froze if if it continues it will continue for india also he was the one who said you know i see fi is going to china because they are extremely underweight on china and therefore money could flow there and we could get affected and that is really played out uh, uh, this year now so i come to you prashant what is your take this year you know next one year now that that foreign money has already flown into china second was brazil which pretty much to occupied our space that we had in the past year and we are like humongously negative so next year does this reverse again so malakshmi maybe i was right just by chance <laughs> <laughs> i mean i had no great insights but see these flows are extremely hard to forecast but the great news in india is that equities have moved from a peripheral asset class to a center of the place asset class for households and india's pool of household savings is very large just financial savings is 300 billion dollars a year so i think the volatility that we have seen in the past and we were talking about decoupling so our economies have never really been coupled materially it was only in crisis situations that stock markets had short term coupling and i think even that will probably reduce now because you have seen as manish was saying 30 billion of selling and markets have done well so maybe this pace of uh, uh, flows may not sustain locally because unlike last two years where bank deposit rates were extremely low now i think we are moving into a situation where bank deposit rates could move up sharply but still i think the flow of local savings should be significant and the volatility that we have seen in the past relating to fi outflows may not be there to that extent but what happens to fi flows i really have no crystal ball but on one hand you could be faced with uh, us interest rates uh, going up which is negative for ems in general on the other hand i think india is indeed emerging as a stand alone core asset class i mean it's the fifth largest economy in the world it's the fourth largest market and more importantly it is the fastest growing economy by far mm. in the world i mean look at what is happening to china uh, look at their growth rates look at our growth rates so the gap between india's and world gdp growth rates i think is uh, extremely healthy and sustainable so i would not worry too much about that okay well actually if i can just come in this fi flow this you also word the world humongous But, but you know, if you <laughs> any look at to, it look at all of this in the context with 650 billion dollars of total FI inflow, out of which we have seen outflows of 35 billion dollar roughly from uh, from uh, secondary market. They have pumped in something like 15, 20 billion dollars in the primary market already. So what we have seen is seen is only 2 percent outflow on the base on a net net basis. So by any stretch of imagination, that can't it can't be mm. like you know, it, it's not a big deal per se. The other reason why we actually the money went out for good reasons, because Russia collapsed, China collapsed, emerging market in general collapsed. So India's weightage has actually gone up, and the people who are following the weightage system of investing money and most inst- most most large institutions follow it. So the selling came. because our weightage went up disproportionately higher because mm. of the other economies doing well so i don't think that so, we should so make year, any so this year how do you see this yeah. year do we because you know some kind of offsetting over the last 3 years has happened so do we see uh, see one thing which i ca- ca- clearly see i don't know this year or 6 months or what two years they have no option but to invest money in india i don't think that you know we we can live with the fastest and the best growing economy and we can remain under invested now the question is which kind of money will come 
the money could come from family offices, it could come from FIIs, it could come from institutions, but I think money will come. Now, the, the mood point is, when they sold, it got absorbed by the local. When they come to buy $50 billion, what happens to the market? Sure, sure. Fair enough. I will just add, we focus a lot on only FII flow in secondary market. There is a larger flow in private equity right? and even larger flow now in FDI. And like we spoke earlier about the geopolitical changes which are taking place, I do not think two years ago you could have dreamt that Apple will launch iPhone 14 and say make in India. Hmm. So, it is clear that the world in their mind has made up its mind that you know India is a friendly shore. Hmm. We can put up capacities over here to replace what we had done for 30 years in China. If provided we do all the right things, yeah. I think there is a manufacturing renaissance waiting to happen. I have sat on P and I have sat in companies. For example, the European energy costs are so high mm. and they were also so dependent on China that chemical industry will shut down over there and it has to, the entire industry has to move. Today, the profit pool of Indian chemical industry, excluding pet chem, mm. is $4 billion, mm. which is nothing in the context right. of the world. Right. Just as an example, the shock we got to our system on saying, I can't get defense equipment in a crisis has spurred us to say we have to start manufacturing ourselves. Other countries will also want to start then getting stuff produced from India for themselves. So, the, the space which has opened up for FDI and private equity is I think far, far greater than what is going to come from the FII side. Thirdly, for us to believe at $3 trillion in a $100 trillion world market cap, we are a separate asset class, sorry, not yet. We will get there, but first will be FDI, then private equity and only then most guys and we'll I include all of us in that are followers of trend lines and momentum. If the market does well, forget 50, 75 billion can come. Right. If the market does badly, 50 can go out. So, so the, co the, the cost so effect is actually reverse you are saying. The market yeah, goes like up, the last year what he said, they could not sell China and they could not sell uh, uh, Russia. So, you sell where you are able to, which was India. Yeah, and, and they sold financials because that is what they held. Russia, the whole eating. thing was frozen. Yeah. That, you know, and yeah. It was a big, it was a big uh, weightage yeah. in the overall index. It was a big weightage. Correct. Fair enough. Samir, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was saying that uh, this FIIs, why are you worrying about FIIs? First of all, they would have in just the two years of COVID and after that would have made at least $150 billion or $120 billion if you take it. 50% on the 300 odd billion that 400 that they might have had at that time. So now they are at 600 odd. So the second thing is the FII and the private equity guys coming from the same pool. It's not coming from different pools. The pool is of these four or five endowments or sovereign funds or family offices. It's not that there is some fifth category of P guys. So in the fact that they put 60 billion last year into private equity, and maybe only 5, 10 billion in FII, that 5, 10 billion. See, the thing is, what do, we, let's be practical, what do we need now? They have been selling 30 billion dollars or they have sold 30 billion dollars. If next year they say we only will buy 2 billion dollars, we'll be very happy because the Indians can take it over. Right now, the thing has been that we have had to absorb as Indian investors 30 billion of selling. You need 5 billion. Story over for the market. And we are only talking about the market here, economy, if you want to talk separately have a different panel discussion. The point is, it's too, uh, this thing, and also look at it big picture. For 25 years, FI flows have been positive for, I think, 21 years. How did we get to this 600 billion when broadly every year, maximum I think we may have got is 20, 30 billion is because they've been putting it forever, putting in forever. Therefore, suddenly it's not going to stop because this year they have redeemed. Uh, by the way, they've sold 45 billion from uh, Taiwan and more than 30 from uh, Korea this year. And by the way, when people say they are putting money in China, let's be sympathetic to them <laughs> and send them to psychologists because it's just a case of Stockholm syndrome. That these guys have been stuck and over bullish and carrying that flag and they've made zero money for 10, 20 years. So they are not able to walk away. But slowly some of them who are smarter will walk away or at least reduce. Fair enough, fair enough. But the, 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 finally, the point is that the money went there, it didn't come here. So that's something we should worry about, right? 
No, no it's not a loss. They make money. They make your money. Either let them lose money. No. That's a different story altogether. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Sunil, uh, on the moving to the domestic flows, uh, you know, I saw the uh, a slide that Manish shared uh, before this discussion, where you know uh, the 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 time series was the MF money and the DII money, and I see that the DII money is fairly inconsistent. You know, year wise, if you see. mfs have been fairly consistent but still at a uh, you know uh, as 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 um, as late as 2019 and 2016 you had about 7 billion dollars today we uh, this year was at 21 billion dollars so there is still a huge gap and it's because of this 21 billion dollars that we have been able to sustain the markets at the levels that we have so now is that again what is the cost effect there is it a function of good markets meaning more money steady flows that becomes a counterbalance or you know uh, can that really be taken for granted that irrespective of markets this is now sticky money that can remain so again you know if you see the history of uh, the indian investor and you know you worked a long uh, time in mutual funds uh, you know 20 years back the concept of systematic investment plan did not exist and that time what you said was right you know in in good times uh, everyone is to come to the markets uh, at the slightest hint of a correction they is to just uh, exit lock stock and barrel i think that is changed now on a monthly basis we have sip flows of 2 billion dollars and they have been very sticky even during covid times there was hardly any you know reduction maybe a small reduction here and there but they have been very very sticky i think it's the hni flows which tends to be a little bit more volatile but uh, heads off to the indian uh, retail investors they have understood this concept of uh, investing regularly and having confidence in the indian economy and i think this 20 25 billion dollars a year looks very very sticky on top of it you have the pension flows which again you know uh, on an average are 1 to 1 and 1/2 billion dollars a month and i think that makes this pool of money really really sticky uh, obviously the the large family offices and the hnis do take some call in the markets but again you know i think if you see from their perspective uh, everyone has understood that ultimately over a period of time it is equity which is the only way you can uh, generate wealth uh, and outperform all other asset classes and i think this whole concept of professionally managing money uh, it's really really become big over the last 5 7 years you know so a lot of families have wealth and there are so many families who are now wealthy Uh, instead of just putting money in land and putting money here and there, I think they are now very systematically investing in equity markets. Uh, they might take some technical call here and there, but ultimately, majority of their wealth is going to be invested in this country uh, by way of either private equity or public markets. But it is going to come into equity markets, and I think that uh, gives us a lot of ability to grow as an economy at maybe six, seven percent or higher. uh without uh, too much of fi flows and in fact if fi flows come which at least uh, i believe will come with a vengeance then this growth rate of 6 6 1/2 7 percent can inch up to 8 percent because all said and done i think if there is capital flow and there is capital formation it definitely adds gdp so from a domestic perspective absolutely no doubt that this flow is going to continue and uh, you know if the foreigners return which they will uh i think then it will just be a catalyst to uh, the economy rising even further fair enough anyone who disagrees with this i mean the the hni money being not sticky and will that make a dent at all malakshmi the if you look at the retail ownership of india it is uh, going up the direct retail ownership it is steadily going up and i last i think we had computed this number it was almost i think 5000 crores a month is direct retail ownership so i think retail flows are here to stay but the extent of it i think only time can answer because one big change that is happening from 2 years back 2 years back retail ownership was extremely low and please remember what happened in the covid year locals were massive sellers yeah. so the equity ownership base was extremely low which is not the case uh, now almost 20% of household financial savings flow has gone into equities which is quite a reasonable number second is in covid times the bank deposit rates were extremely extremely low 
and now you are at a level where credit growth is outpacing deposit growth by almost 7 percent. So, whatever excess liquidity is there with the banks is disappearing. So, bank deposit rates have to go up sharply and the moment bank <coughs> deposit rates start touching 8, 9 percent and along with that last one year 18 months no money has been made. So, I think let time answer this that how does the retail flow behave in mm. this uh, environment, but I do agree with Sunil that equities have moved from a seasonal asset class to a seasonal asset class, but the extent of flows I do not think one can accurately take a view on that right now. Fair enough. So, just moving on to sectors and stocks, so let we will just hit the bets part. So, should we start with uh, Sameer? I do not talk about bets because my whole philosophy is that I have 15, 20 new kind of stocks, new listings or old stocks which have fallen a lot or something happened and I have two and a half percent each in 20 stocks for 50 percent and some of them will do very well but I won't know exactly which ones will do well at what time. So, for example, how would I have known at the end of last year that suddenly this year some Varun beverage will go up 80 percent or some lemon tree will go up 80 percent, you don't know. I just played as a pool and that statistic, uh, statistically has worked for me forever. Last year you did agree to financial Sameer and the yeah, other yeah, bet was got of course broadly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh sorry, if you sectors, yeah sure. So sectors, sectors and for or us. teams whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Plus your so bet on speaking, fintechs, fin plus your bet on fintechs. <laughs> Not ah, to fintechs forget. Worked last time I said that 50 percent will disappear, I do not know how many. But I am saying in general, if you talk about sectors, then it is mostly always financials, consumer and IT, pharma, specialty, chemical, which we call as exporter theme. But currently, I have zero in IT for the first time in 27, 26 years. But otherwise, I have financials in consumer and a little bit of pharma and specialty chemicals. But generally, otherwise, big picture, we always like these three themes, uh, private sector financials, consumer and these exporter theme. Uh, so overall, over, that is your overall strategy anyway. I mean, those are the three uh, buckets that you do because you do not. You said what are my sectors, so I am telling for you this my sectors. Year, for <laughs> this year, for this year, any specific. No, thing? no, they do not change. Oh, see, this year, if you say relatively, then as I said, I have basically reduced IT to zero at least for the first five, six months, I would think. I mean, from here, five, seven months and then we see how it goes because even if everything is good, I still have to choose. It is not that, oh, is IT bad? No, it may not be bad, but I have to bet whether it will outperform my other sectors or not. And in consumer, my stocks are mostly those which I hope will grow at 20 percent plus and not this 10, 15 percent plus. And they are basically catering to uh, low ticket consumer, if I call them, which is that they are for the middle class, leave out the first 50 lakh people and leave out the bottom 70 percent. But for the rest, it should be some value for money and reasonable ticket as I will call it. Fair enough. Just uh, spending little couple of minutes on IT. So, anybody has a different view on IT? I mean, you know, I see a lot of uh, uh, polarized view Sunil is on quite IT. bullish Sunil, on IT. Sunil, are you a contrarian on IT today? Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, Mahalakshmi, I think uh, obviously uh, IT in India is very different from uh, IT in NASDAQ. Uh, we are IT services. We are basically more like, uh, you know, providing uh, value services to the world. And if you actually see IT except uh, post Lehman, uh, when, you know, there was actually a degrowth, IT sector in India has never degrown in volume terms. You know, the growth rate might have varied anywhere between 7-8% to as high as 20%. Uh, but uh, volume growth has always been between, uh, between that. And I think now uh, there is obviously this fear about uh, degrowth. Uh, September numbers so far have been phenomenal. The order book has in fact gone up for IT companies. Yeah. And this is uh, in a quarter which was post uh, the war and in a quarter where uh, the fear of uh, uh, recession was the maximum. Again, this is a sector where India has global competitiveness. I think we are maybe the market leader as far as uh, the back office or the IT services is concerned. Uh, companies uh, overseas uh, will, if they struggle, uh, continue to outsource. And these are companies which are also going to benefit from the tailwind which the uh, the recent uh, depreciation of rupee has uh, provided. And the headwinds in terms of costs are behind us. And again, this is a sector which pays off almost 100% of what they make. And the cash flow is also 100%. So I think uh, from year on, you know, if you're expecting the market to be like mid kind of returns, I think this is a sector uh, which should give you that. 
And we have also seen every four, five years, something happens where the sector suddenly doubles in a year. So I think in a base case, on an annual basis, you make 14, 15%, and then one year you hit a jackpot, that year you end up making 60, 70% extra. Okay. Are valuations really comforting in that space? Because even in, you know, if you look at TCS or a or uh, uh, or uh, infi they'll all be upwards of uh, 20 times which of course in the context of several other stocks doesn't look as expensive but if you are just looking at a 10 percent average uh, growth yeah we have consumption stocks which grow at 10 percent trading at 80 90 p no one and questions you? the valuation of those companies <laughs> we so question the it. it companies which will look at volume and everything else we question it all the time sunil <laughs> <laughs> best in your discussion with Mahalak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, on the PSU pack, I mean, uh, before we move to the next bet, one question on the PSU pack. Uh, Madhu, you've been very bullish on the PSU bank space. Are you really bullish on the entire bank space? You can clarify that. And secondly, <laughs> that's uh, got a, really you know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, PSU momentum got somewhat derailed except for a few, uh, you know, outperformers and the disinvestment uh, has somewhat uh, softened. And do you see that picking up in the second part of the year, will it become a bigger compulsion for the government to accelerate that? And therefore, will, will that become a trigger for uh, PSU stocks in the second half? So, first of all, let me say this, I have broken this myth in my own mind <laughs> that this sector will do well or that sector will do well. Yes, we have to choose from within yeah, the sector. Yeah. But I think we have to buy just buy the best company mm -hmm. in the sector. Then only you make uh, serious money, right? But so best, say, is, best is difficult to understand. No, best best is, is, is it cheap? Is, best is, is it quality? But this is, is your it? perception of, you know, it doesn't come only, uh, I hope it was as simple that you could put some number okay. and arrive at a best idea. You will not have a panel of six people <laughs> sitting here. Right? I won't so have a job. I, so. I, I, I feel so you have to just be able to buy the best possible company and hope that really works. So you may choose from... So I was never bullish on the PSU banking as a whole sector. I was bullish on a few stocks and by the grace of God, it has worked really well uh, mm. for me, right? So again, you know, coming back to the overall is there, PS, still, is there still value I think in so. I think so. Stocks? You look at the results which have come, you know, one result which came today, it's stunning. Absolutely. Mm. I would say there is still a steam and uh, the, this, this stock could still do well. The other point about which you make it, that you know disinvestment i think you have to consider that 2024 is election year hmm. so i don't think any fire sale which will happen maybe few pending cases may get resolved yeah but post 2024 is where i think there will be a lot of excitement if modi ji comes back and uh, there is a bjp stable government then you will see a, a real big drive uh, towards disinvestment but i am not particularly very excited that lot will get disinvested in the next 18 months. Fair enough. Prashant, your favorite hunting ground in the past, does it remain that way? No, I think these stocks were mispriced and as Manish was saying prior to this discussion that what people don't like, often there is value and you can see I mean, this stock space has done quite well because there are both good and bad, bad PSUs and good and not so good private sector companies. So, if you focus on good companies and good valuations, eventually returns come. And today, if you look at whether the banking space, the mining space, the power space, the defense space, these stocks have done extremely well. And I think there is still some value to my mind in the banking and the energy space. Fair enough. Sunil, your bet for the year. No, again, you know, without getting into uh, you know, stocks, I think, uh, you know, we run a diversified fund and predominantly, you know, I would agree that sectors in India tend to be, uh, you know, predominantly financials because at 35-40% of the market as well as the economy. I am uh, at least not underweight IT, we're not very overweight IT, but I continue to believe that uh, this is a sector which uh, has, uh, uh, you know, uh, very steady legs over a long period of time. I think pharma is turning out to be an exciting sector at this point of time. Uh, it might be slow to begin with, but uh, companies are again are clean. Uh, the, you know, one, one and a half years of low growth uh, because of non-COVID side of the business not doing that well, restocking some headwinds because of supply chain issues, particularly raw material from China. 
are sort of getting behind us. So I think that 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 is a sector where uh, you know at uh, 15 to 20 times these are good quality companies. So I would say that uh, pharma over FMCG would be a preferred bet. And then you know we are all looking at India growing at six to eight percent. Banks have the ability to lend, which was not the case last five years. And therefore, you know, anything to do with capex, uh, I think, should also uh, pretty much do well. And finally, you know, uh, Samir, I mentioned the the lower end of the consumption. You know, I would agree that the tier two, tier three side of the consumption, I think, we have just uh, started. So in the next five seven years, the aspiration of uh, the the you know the midtowns and uh, the villages and because of access to uh, information, I think that side of the consumption we are very positive. So your top bet bet would be pharma. No, I would not say it's a top bet, but it's a it's a sector where we would like to go overweight. We are still not overweight. We have started nibbling, okay. uh, but that is one uh, sector which can give you that alpha uh, which you need as a as a, at the portfolio level. Fair enough, Devina. Yeah, like Samir, I mean, we also have a diversified portfolio. So we always have a number of sectors, number of companies, because you don't know which ones will be the multi-baggers. Uh, so for the past one year, the sector we've been most overweight on and which actually has given several multi-baggers has been capital goods and industrial machinery. And uh, that we went overweight last October and we continue to be overweight at the moment. It still looks good because it came out of a very, very long, yeah. uh, you know, beaten down phase right from 2009 for 12, 13 years. So we were sure it would give a big uh, move. And there are fundamental changes also from PLI to government uh, CapEx and so on. So uh, and that prolonged downturn meant the companies had become lean. So. That still continues, whether it will continue for the whole year, I don't know, because we always reevaluate everything every quarter. Uh, and we say that don't be a bear, don't be a bull, be a hare, because a hare moves fast and can change direction. But at the moment, that remains. IT, we had liked a lot from 2020 onwards, where it I had uh, thought it was a very good switch from FMCG, which at that time was the hot sector, right. gave us great returns for the year and a half thereafter. You know, it, of course, you know, this calendar year it didn't do so well. We would be about market weight there, no longer overweight. Uh, but but um, I do think that there is no great negative also because, you know, it is a dollar hedge, it is predictable, and the cost pressure when the startups were taking away people at high salaries is gone because startups no longer have the money to do that. In textiles and chemicals, it is not a sector as a whole uh, because there are companies with very different dynamics within the sector. Chemicals, for example, if you look at commodity prices, there are uh, companies where input prices have gone up and therefore margins will get squeezed but there are companies where output prices have gone up where which are seeing a bonanza so we've been picky but those have also had opportunities in the last three to six months things we've added on have been a couple of fmcg names uh, again you know not everything across the board and auto four wheelers auto components so those would be things where we are uh, uh somewhat uh, overweight just now so that would be it pharma has been a good space in the defensive sense but it is not something where we expect no uh, great results when the market goes up so right but now we are fairly diverse. and and we have finance uh, you know banks and financial services we are not overweight but uh, in my mind from where i usually am i am this is not a sector that i ever like because I'm always scared that the possibility of a negative surprise is always higher than that of a positive surprise. So last till last year, we would have had negligible weight, considering this is such a large weight in the index and which proved to be right because 2020, that was the only sector that was negative in 2021. It was not negative, but it went up only half as much as the market. So from there, we think like at least the better times ahead. Uh, because as interest rates go up, you know, margins go up on the margin for banks, uh, credit growth has picked up. So now we would be close to market weight in the banks, which is rare for us. So uh, capital goods continues to be your top weight right now? Yes, right now okay. it, it is the most overweight at least okay. in our uh, portfolios. 
also another theme which which our systems are throwing up quite clearly is that the small and mid caps are currently looking better than the large caps though we always you know in risk management sense we cap our exposure to some of those but definitely our systems are liking that space more sure so back to sunil sunil what's your view i mean do you think this year will belong to small and mid caps selectively yes because that <laughs> so i think you know if you again see uh, over the last uh, 25 30 years i think smaller companies obviously have uh, an entrepreneurial tilt to it and they tend to be more volatile but ultimately they tend to be uh, higher alpha generators at the same time alakum you can't uh, classify them as one basket you know i think to classify everything as mid cap and small cap is uh, is not right because these tend to be very stock specific uh and you know i think whether uh, as a sec- as a segment they do well or not uh, you know time and again we have seen yeah. that there are more than handful of companies uh, which uh, uh, you know offer you great potential uh, to make uh, you know outsized returns the good thing about india is that we are a country driven by entrepreneurs we have you know almost 1500 2000 companies which are worth investing at different levels of market cap and i think that uh, uh, provides us opportunity also makes our job very interesting you know Fair so enough. we are very hopeful that uh, uh, the way uh, you know things are uh, sort of stabilizing in terms of at least the domestic side of the economy and also the fact that uh, most of these companies now are very prudent in terms of their financial leverage uh, you know so the shocks which used to be earlier there in smaller companies i think they will have uh, they they have reduced quite significantly and this uh, uh, this uh, predictability is what leads to uh, reality so you know we continue to be very very optimistic on that space fair enough prashant your big bet for this year so malakshmi as i said i think the energy space and the uh, banks the large banks with a good liability franchise and a good techno uh, i mean digital platform i think they continue to look uh, good I do. I answer a little differently, you know, apart from the sectors which we discussed. So, Malachi, there is evidence to show two things, at least in the last six months. While the mid-cap index and the small-cap index have remained largely flat, even on a six-month basis, there are more than 300 companies which have given more than 20 percent return in three months. Mm. and there are more than 200 companies and this i am talking of out of the top 1000 companies so mm. we are not going to the you know, bangar cap mm. you know so <laughs> we are saying uh, and there are more than 200 companies which have given more than 20% return in the last 6 months mm. so clearly you know markets are telling us something that some of these companies as sunil was saying have really consolidated well mm. they have they been managed their balance sheets well you know so we have to Uh, if you have to really make money in india that has been the story for last 25 years right mm. you have to go be be able to go and pick the bottom up stories really well right so one differentiated sector which i like which no one is talking about is the infra companies specifically mm. the service side of the companies they have consolidated quite a lot it's been a 15 year period where there is no money which is being made i think lot of there is a competition intensity has gone down meaningfully well there is a cousin mm-hmm. of mine who lives in raipur he tells me that you get get me bank guarantee and i will pay you 5% so no mm-hmm. 5% only to get bank guarantee so and he is in the business for last 20 years so we see there is a premium to right. a good balance sheet and these companies i think relative to what they were trading in the past and relative to their potential mm-hmm. and again assuming 24 is the election Hmm. so there will be execution heavy years hmm. for the next 2 years a lot of these companies so this is one sector which could surprise on the upside in the next 24 months sure manish so i'd like to say the following that in like i said in the beginning the era of unidirectional bets is gone hmm. there is no 30 year bull market in bonds and 30 year right. pe expansion similarly there is no sector which is going to beat because in a slow growth world it's mm. someone who's gaining at someone else's expense right rather than a trend line which is carrying all the boats even if you see last year like prashant rightly pointed out the stocks which were hated psus including coal india mm. including the defense psus hal bel 
uh, ITC, which mm -hmm. was anti ESG theme, yeah. they are the ones which have done well. Even if I take auto, you would have lost money in Tata Motor and you would have made it in surprise, surprise, TVS Motor. Correct. So, I don't think this sectoral bet, and I'm not a professional money manager managing, and I yeah. don't need to buy yeah. 30, 40 stocks. You think like a business owner. There are businesses I like, the businesses I understand, but if I like the price, I buy them. If I reflect on where I am today, it's, it looks like it's largely financials, but having said that, you could have been in Kotak and HDFC Bank and lost money over the last three years or been flat. And you would have bought the much hated at that yeah. time, ICICI, Axis and SBI and made money. Maybe the time for, I think the HDFC Bank time is coming. Mm. When MSCI has to get them out of the indice, uh, you know, NFT has to get them out because there's merger, there's uncertainty. Will they be able to raise deposits? There could be money to be made in something such main street as something mm. like that. Mm. The other thing worth reflecting, all these gentlemen and lady, they ran big mutual funds at some point. They are all sitting and running asset management businesses today. Is that not a sector worth betting on? Mm. It's a listed space. It's the biggest consumption item in India. More than toothpaste, you'll be eventually putting more Maybe money into asset funds. asset management companies. Yeah, they, people don't, they hate them because they think the BIPs are falling every year. Mm. Uh, industry will fragment, it will become passive, it will become ETF. I don't think that's going to happen. If you're getting to $10 trillion GDP, do you think our asset management companies will remain so small? Mm -hmm. We look at capital and fidelity. Why would someone not emerge like that out of India? And that's the bet they're taking on their careers now. So we'll anybody, see at a price. Anybody has a contrary You get a price this? for businesses you know, like this will be discarded. Worth doing. They are not small in market cap. If you look at the market cap of HDFC mutual fund and compare it to market cap of Templeton and Alliance and all these who have 800 billion, 1 trillion more, the market caps of those per billion dollar of assets would be maybe one third of what it is in. So the company AUN might be smaller, but the market caps are not small. Sure. We'll wait so for you don't the like the valuation, essentially yeah, you don't obviously. like the valuation. Everything at a price. Yeah, because obviously. it's a tough business and now I am entering, so I like them even less. <laughs> <laughs> Prashant and now Prashant is also not there. I'm saying Prashant is also not there, so I can. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Now we move to the most exciting uh, round, which is the songs round, and I'm going to throw some names of stocks, and um, and you have to you have to uh, suggest a song that is that befits the description of the stock or the performance of the stock uh, this year or where they stand this year. Sameer, HDFC Bank. Easy are the... Je pehchano, kaha se aaya, mein hu Don. Super. Fair enough. Wo toh abhi yaad hi dilana padega. Okay, campus, campus shoes. So campus, you know, I bought it in the after IPO on that day, but it's not one of my top holdings. But I just <laughs> that day I went on TV and said I bought it, and you know, because I gave a few names. But anyway, you know, my favorite Punjabi song right now is, but I don't know whether you guys understand Punjabi. Some of you do. Udi Menu Kendi. Have you heard the song? Ha ha. Udi Menu Kendi, Jutta Le De Sonia. Fair enough. Lemon tree, again for you. No, I'm not. I don't know anymore. I just thought because you gave me two minutes notice. Okay, fair I enough. No well, actually, you need to update your list. <laughs> no, no, no. Lemon tree stock. Lemon tree have, henna. He has for it. He doesn't have a song he for it. He has. Here. Because he just gave me a few minutes notice and said, make some songs. <laughs> HDFC to the mark mein aagya, fada fad. <laughs> Fair enough. Canada Bank, uh, Madhu? So I think uh, I'll sing only one song for all the companies which I like. So you can just all take All the it. companies. Uh, all the companies. Ab absolutely. absolutely. So this describes. Bade achhe lagte hain Ye dharti Ye nadiya Ye rena or tum. Nice, nice. So you like all stocks. So, yeah. okay. so all the stocks which I like. <laughs> Fair enough. Adani stocks, Madhu. So I can remember one song which possibly can describe Adani stock. 
चग घूमिया तेरे जैसा ना कोई फॉर दिस ईयर फॉर दिस ईयर फॉर श्योर एब्सोल्युटली ओके प्रशांत एस बी आई बिफोर दैट कोल इंडिया जिसका कोई नहीं उसका तो खुदा है यार देर ओनली टू इंस्टीट्यूशन विच यूज टू ओन कोल इंडिया एंड यू कैन सी वॉट एज फेर एडफ आई टी सी अगेन वन ऑफ योर फेवरेट पिक्स एंड बाकी लोगों के पास नहीं था आपके पास था जिसका मुझे था इंतजार वो घड़ी आ गई अगेन यू कैन आई मीन इट सी आई मीन दिस इज वॉट इज सरप्राइजिंग अबाउट स्टॉक मार्केट सी द प्राइस हैज अ ग्रेट इन्फ्लुएंस ऑन द वे वी थिंक इवन पीपल हुव लॉन्ग ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस इन स्टॉक मार्केट्स आई मीन वॉट इज चेंज इन दिस कंपनी Absolutely nothing. There has been no change. At least in banks, NPAs have uh, gone down, and energy energy prices have gone up. But what has changed for this stock? Absolutely nothing. Oh, fair enough. H A L. Devina, you can also take this. So maybe the, I'll pass this to Devina. Mm-hmm. Devina. देश को बनाना है मशीनों का नगर. वो गाना है ना नन्ना मुन्ना राही हूँ देश का सिपाही हूँ चलो मेरे सन <laughs> बोलो मेरे सन जय हिंद जय हिंद पार्ट ऑफ दैट आगे आगे बढ़ाए जा कदम ओके टाटा मोटर्स नॉट फॉर मी एनी बडी On a on a lighter note, you can do it. Of course, great greatest company. But it, the song which may match the most is "Mera Juta Hai Japani Hai Patloon Englishani Sar Pe Lag To Pe Rusi Fir Bhi Dil Hai Hindustani." Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Very well said. Manish, uh, IT stocks for you in fee. IT stocks is the sector which has saved our country. So I, like, tumko dekha to ye khayal aaya. Zindagi dhup tum ghana chaya. protecting our nation where would we fair be enough, without it sector fair enough fair enough <laughs> yeah good hats off to them z okay hum honge kamyab ek din i guess devina tata lxi utna hi upkar samajh koi jitna saath nibha de janam maran ka saath अपॉर्चुनिटी ने आग लगाई Thank you so much uh, gentlemen and okay. Devina thank you so much it was uh, wonderful talking to you people as always and wish all of you a very happy diwali and of course our viewers also a very very happy diwali thank you so much